Great. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, the webinar today is called More Data, Less Clicks, and that's really been a theme of uh, this release of High Byte Intelligence Hub version 2.4. And today we're going to talk about how to automate your industrial data operations with templates and event flows. And I really love these post-release webinars because it's such a great opportunity to reflect on all of the work that went into this release. Um, and this one's particularly exciting since we've already received such great feedback from, uh, from our customers on some of these new capabilities. So we're excited to share them with you today. And today I'm joined by John Harrington and Aaron Semley. John Harrington is the Chief Product Officer at Highbyte, and Aaron Semley is our Chief Technology Officer. Um, so I, I, I won't do too much of an intro here, but just a little bit of housekeeping um, before I hand it to John for today's agenda. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to all of you after um, the webinar is over within, um, you know, tomorrow, within the next 24 hours. We'll send that out by email um, upon request too. We can also provide the, the deck for this presentation if anyone is interested for that. And then finally, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A tool at the bottom of the webinar screen, and I'll respond to those in real time or save them for our panelists at the end of the webinar. And with that, John, you wanna get us started? Thank you, Tori. Um, everyone hear me okay? Yeah, here, let me just put on my, my video. And, okay. You should be able to see me as well. Um, so thank you, Tori. Uh, it's great to uh, see everyone, see everyone coming to these webinars. It's great to uh, expose you to what's going on. I think there are some, some familiar names on the list, but also some new names on the list. Um, so we'll give a quick overview of Highbyte as well. Um, so for the agenda today, like I said, quick introduction to Highbyte for those of you who are new to us. Um, and then we'll jump into our key topics. So scalability was the real key theme of this release, both scalability of the configuration as well as scalability of data flows. And I'll get into what that means. And then we're going to spend the majority of the time in demos. So Aaron's going to show us some awesome demos that he's created on templating, custom conditions, event-based flows, ETL, and lots of other uh, new capabilities that he's going to highlight um, in those demos. And then, as Tori said, we're going to end the session with a live Q&A. So feel free to enter any uh, questions that you have on the question panel. Um, also, if you have any issues, feel free to chat with Tori. But, um, you know, we look forward to having a uh, live dialogue at the end and uh, answer any questions and talk about um, what's coming. By the way, this release, version 2.4, did release last week. So if you have access to the software today, feel free to download it, try it out, experience it. Um, if you need access to the software, reach out to us. I would be happy to talk with you and get you access to a trial or, or to the software. Brief uh, bit about Highbyte. So Highbyte is a software company. We are focused in uh, providing manufacturing companies uh, with data infrastructure solutions. So as companies are are trying to adopt industry 4.0 concepts in smart manufacturing and drive their businesses uh, more efficiently. Um, Highbyte provides the infrastructure to be able to efficiently move data across, across your enterprise with a real focus on industrial data. Um, our headquarters uh, for Highbyte is, is we're headquartered in the United States um, in Portland, Maine. So we're about two hours north of Boston. Um, and this is kind of the best weather uh, going um, is this time of year to come visit. So if anyone wants to come visit, we'd love to see you and meet you. And I would recommend over the next three or four months to, uh, to come visit. Um, so Highway has really focused on the manufacturing industry, but it's broadly across the manufacturing industry. So we have customers in food and beverage, pharmaceuticals, pulp and paper, industrial products, consumer products, auto, and lately, we've been getting more and more in the energy and mining industry as well. So broad range of customers um, and a broad uh, range of geographies. So we have partners as well as customers across the globe, and we're happy to support you wherever you're at. 
to give you a brief overview of our solution. So the Hivite Intelligence Hub is, is the software product that, that Hivite produces. And it's a data hub specifically for Industry 4.0. And so we move data from all your different systems to and from all of them. So we can collect data um, from your machine data, from your OPC servers, or from your sensors, or from your devices, or files. We can pull that data together with your MES data, your historian data, so your time series data, with ERP information, and um, package that up and send that to the cloud. At the same time, maybe we need to feed the ERP or need, need to feed the MES with information. So it's very flexible on moving data around and really breaks down the old hierarchy, the old Purdue model as it pertains to data flows. And we do that by providing an abstraction layer, making all those connections and modeling data at the core. So the core of our solution is is a modeling engine that allows you to standardize and contextualize that data, and then to flow that data out using flows. So think of these as data pipelines that you're establishing between different systems. And it's not just system to system, but it can be multiple systems produce data, we aggregate it together into common models, and then publish that out. What's really unique about Hybyte is our focus on industrial data. Our team has deep experience in industrial data um, from the PLCs and the sensors all the way up to where that data is going to the cloud um, with all the systems in between. So how to connect to these systems and work with them. The solution is a codeless solution. We're gonna show you some techniques on how to use a little bit of coding if you need to do some really advanced data transformations. But in general, you can establish these data flows without doing any coding at all. And it can run on premise. In fact, most of our customers run it on premise. And we recommend you run it as close to the sources of data as possible. Because as soon as we can acquire that data, we can be highly efficient in the way that we deliver it to the next step in making sure that you do get it to the next step. So, so it can be installed on premise. It can be installed in a data center or in the cloud really up to you. That gives you some overview of the Hybite Intelligence Hub, and you're gonna see it in just a minute here. But I also wanted to talk about scalability because that's really the theme of our release today or, or our 2.4 release. And scalability was built into the Intelligence Hub even in version one. So at the core, we were thinking about scalability. And the reason for that is that there's massive amounts of data available in a factory. And not only in the PLCs in the equipment in the factory floor, but also in all the systems that support the factory floor. And people wanna get access to that data for analytics and use it in the cloud for analytics, visualization, that sort of thing. So in version one, we really focused on modeling and flows as a, as a way of creating abstraction. So with modeling, you create a, um, you can batch together multiple pieces of information, multiple pieces of data into a single payload, and then you can send those out in a flow. And that way, instead of managing every single piece one by one, you can manage them in a set. And then with a flow, you can manage multiple instances of those models. And so you can further abstract them so that you're not having to manage 750,000 data points. Now you're managing them at an abstracted level. Now, if you take that one step further, in our 2.0 release, we provided the ability to have multiple hubs. And then you could have a single control pane with multiple hubs, either within a site or across multiple sites. So we added additional scalability to the solution as people started to deploy the intelligence hub and deploy multiple intelligence hubs across their enterprise. With version 2.4, we're taking scalability to a whole new level. And it starts with templates. So, you know, with version one and version two, you may have um, a pump and you do your data mapping. So you can pull all the pump data into a single payload, a single model, and then you flow that out to the target system that you're trying to send it to. But we had a number of customers who came to us and said, look, I have 50 pumps and they're all identical. 
So I don't want to have to do that data mapping 50 times. I only want to have to do it once. And that's where templates come into play. So when you have um, highly consistent data, then you can just use a template. You do the mapping once, and then you tell the template through parameters how to, how to access the variances of where you get that, that other source data for the different pumps. And so you're able to very quickly scale out when you have highly consistent data, scale out the deployments of HiByte. We also added the ability to add parameters so that you can drive your inputs off of parameters from your instances. And this allows you to have fewer inputs and again, focus on reusing components within the solution and be able to have complete um, linkages between the instances and the inputs and the flows. Another, a couple other key areas that we added for 2.4 around configuration efficiency is OPC collections. So with many of our um, connectors, you could create data sets. So for instance, with MQTT, you get a JSON payload. It's got lots of different values in there and you have a data set and you use that data set throughout HiByte. But with OPC, they were individual tags. So now with OPC collections, you can create a collection of data tags, and then you can use that collection throughout the, the intelligence hub. You can map it into instances. You can even flow it directly out if you just want to move that data up um, to a target system, like up to the cloud. You can also define custom conditions if you need to uh, perform a certain transformation on that data before it gets you before it hits the model. So maybe you get a data set coming in, you need to transform it in some way, and then you want to model it. Well, that's where custom conditions come into play. And the final piece around configuration reuse is global functions, which allows you to define a function and then reference it in any um, in any expression throughout the product. So these features all really contribute to making the configuration of HiByte much more efficient. But there's also an efficiency gained and scalability gained around data. And what we found is when HiByte was initially designed, it was designed as a streaming platform. So we stream data, we pull it from multiple systems, we aggregate it together, model it and send it out immediately. And that works really well. But in some cases, people are pulling so much data and the need for it isn't immediate. So they said, you know, can we batch it up and then publish that up to, for instance, the cloud or publish it to some other target? So we said, well, that, that's a great idea. Let's add some technology around that. And we've added a series of technology around that. The first piece is the ability to log data to a file. So we've had the ability to log to a CSV file, but in this release, we added the ability to log to a Parquet file. In the Apache Parquet format is generally considered um, the ideal format for publishing to a data lake and the ideal, and it's much more compact than like a CSV format. So we added this ability to log to a file and then at some frequency, you can take that file and publish it up to your data lake, maybe Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Storage. Once you get it in there, then you can work with that within HiByte. We also added the ability to log directly into a data warehouse in Amazon. So Amazon's data warehouse is Redshift. So we added a direct connector to the Redshift service. So if you want to just move the data direct and stream it into Redshift, you can do that as well. And finally, we extended our flows to be purely event-based so that you can, whenever a value arrives at HiByte, we'll immediately act on it. So with our subscription-based um, connectors, like MQTT and OPC subscriptions, um, as well as our, our Azure and um, Event Hub and IoT Hub, you can subscribe to topics and get the data in. Similarly, with our uh, REST webhook, data can just be published directly to us. And with this event, you can just publish that data, immediately publish that data out. So these are just ways that we've added, or technology that we've added to Intelligence Hub to, again, provide scalability by efficiently moving data. 
This here is a list of all the features. So I covered most of the new capabilities and most of the new connectors, though we have a few others on the list. But the idea is just to show you all the new capabilities that are in the product. And we've also made a number of improvements to the product. So um, this is not an exhausted list, but it is kind of the a high level uh, list of some of the key features that were improved. Um, at this point, I want to do a couple of polls. So the first poll I'm going to do here is on um, UNS. Now, in my first slide, I had shown with the diagram, I talked um, about moving data to different systems. And we often get asked about UNS. This seems to be a, this is a new term in our industry called a unified namespace. And so we're interested in what people's thoughts are on UNS. Are you familiar with it? Are you using it? Are you just prototyping? Um, give us some feedback on that. Um, and if you have questions on UNS, we would be happy to uh, schedule a call with you and do a deeper dive. We also have some, uh, some videos on our YouTube page that do specifically talk to UNS. So I wanna, I appreciate everyone who's answering uh, these questions. I'm gonna end the poll in just a second here, but this is, um, this is really helpful. Uh, let me just share the results with everyone. So as you can see, there were definitely some people that are not familiar with the term UNS or, or um, in what it is, but there are some people that are prototyping with it and some people that are starting to deploy with it. Um, certainly it seems like prototyping is, is the primary. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to us. We can, we can uh, educate you more on that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Why don't I launch one more poll while Aaron's getting ready to uh, take over the demonstration. In this poll, we're going to um, hear, you know, we talked about adding the S3 and the blob storage. But we're interested in how people are using, you know, what different uh, data lake technologies are people using? Or are they not using data lakes at all or they're using them on-prem? So we'll let this run for just a minute and then uh, Aaron, you can take over. Perfect. Right. Can you I think I'm going to see my screen, John. I can see your screen. I'll right, share the results quick. So um, most people are certainly just keeping their data on premise, though there are definitely some, uh, some Amazon and Azure users out there. So great information. Thank you all for sharing and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Aaron. Awesome. Thank you, John. So yeah, I've got some great features. So I'm just gonna launch into it. I think instead of kind of showing you the features, I'm gonna walk through a use case instead. And as I go through the use case, I'll show you the new stuff in 2.4 that kind of enable it. So my crude drawing of the use case, uh, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm, I wanna model filler performance. So assume we're a bottling line. Uh, and basically I've got data that's coming from machines over OPC UA. I've got da MES data that I'm gonna query over SQL, some performance data or targets. And then I'm also going to hit this, uh, I'll, I'll call it an older HR system to pull in some operator information. And I'll show you kind of how that works. I'll pull that into a model. I'll do it for a single filling machine. And then I'll show you with the templating feature, how you can scale that really quick to N filling machines. And then I'll publish that into a UNS. So you'll kind of see that land in an MQTT broker with the data structure. And then once that's in there, I'll show some of the new 2.4 features to, to attach to a UNS, pull the model data out into Parquet files, bucket that up into a time period, in this case, one minute and then send that up to Azure and uh, AWS, their different uh, data lakes. So that I'll, I'll come back to this, but I'm gonna kind of go left to right uh, and build this out. And the one uh, thing that is notable in the release, when you get the new release in 2.4, if you're on Windows, there is the ability to install it as a service now. So if you go into this service directory and just double click this install service batch file, uh, Highbytes installed as a service and uh, we'll run as such. I'm just gonna run it out of a console window here, but I just wanted to make note that that new capability is in there. All right, so the, the first thing I need to do is go build my connectors, right? So I mentioned, uh, I'm gonna build these. Uh, so I'm gonna call it machine OPC. I'm just gonna build a quick OPC connection. And this is to Kepser EX. And for folks that are new, 
I'm not going to kind of cover the basics of high bite. What you can do is go on the YouTube channel. There's some kind of like 101 stuff there that'll show you connections, conditions, modeling, uh, kind of the basics. So I, I do move somewhat fast just because there's there's quite a bit of features in here. So I've got Kept Server X installed. I've got uh, a channel with some filler devices on it. And typically in older versions, you'd browse and come in and pull in the tags for the filler. But the one feature in 2.4 I want to show you that's really cool is the ability to do OPC collections like John had mentioned. So I'm going to call this fillers. And instead of a tag type, I'm going to select a collection type. And once I do that, I can jump down, go into the browse. I'm, I'm going to model filler one to start. So I'm going to pull in these three tags and add those in. And I'll save my work. And then if I do a read, what you'll see what comes back is the filling machines, uh, that basically the tag name and then the value, right? So you can kind of see what we're doing here. Now, in this case, I'm going to use this input to read all of my fillers. In this case, I have three of them. So the first thing I'm going to do is just manually edit these and remove the filler address from the, from the default name that we created. So it's, it's kind of like pseudo modeling of the OBC data. And once I do this, you'll see just the name, the labels are gonna change, right? So it's not filler one anymore, uh, it's, the, it's whatever filler. So the other thing I wanna do is I wanna make this read any of the fillers, right? So I'm also gonna go in here, I'm gonna add a new 2.4 feature called parameterization. So I can parameterize any input. And this, this works for anything, right? I'll show it over SQL as well. If I can spell right. And the way to do that is we use this handlebar syntax and then we use this dot a parameter name. So I'll submit that. And I'll show you how this works in a second. I'm just going to go in and replace the filler number. And I could have multiple parameters too. In this case, I only have one that I need to modify. So I'm going to make this thing dynamic. Now, if, if I save this and hit read, it's going to fail because it's literally going to go and try to read this address, which doesn't exist. It doesn't know how to replace this. So in order to provide a default value, I'm going to turn on templating on the input. And I'm not necessarily going to use this to template and create multiple values. I'm just going to use it to, to seed a value. So I'm going to put in the filler ID as a default of one. And I'll come up and hit save. And now if I hit read, what this is going to do, it's, it's a little hard to tell, but I'm reading uh, the first filler by this because I'm providing that default value. So let's jump back out. And I've got my OPC UA connection created. So the next one I need to grab, if you remember, is the MES data coming from SQL. So I've got a SQL server installed locally, and I'm just gonna connect to that. Uh, it's a test database with my name to log in. And I don't know how to make Chrome not do that, but uh, I'm just gonna sit, make sure that's saved. I'll go to inputs. No, it's gonna do it again uh, and create an input. And in this case, I've got the fillers table. So I'm gonna browse the tables in the SQL server I'm connected to. I'm gonna pull that table over and I'm gonna write the query real quick just to see what's in there. I'll just select everything from, I'll call this fillers uh, schedule. All right, save my work and then I'll hit execute and you'll see that there's, you know, there's, there's information like what's the target for the shift, you know, how many bottles have we filled? And there's also some quality data. So let's assume some quality system is pulling that in and it's getting entered manually. Now, just like OPC, I want this to be filler specific. So you can see there's a filler number in here, and this is the first filler. So I'm going to add to the query and say where filler number is equal to, and I'm going to use the same parameterized in, in, uh, input syntax, so filler ID. There we go, and save that. And again, if I hit execute on this, this is going to fail because it doesn't know what to replace this with. But if I want to see the default value, I'm just going to turn on templating, and I'm going to add in a default for that parameter. In this, it's gonna be a little easier to see what it's doing. So if I had execute, you can see filler number one is, is passed in. If I change this to filler two as the default and hit execute, you see that's getting replaced with two and then uh, filler two comes back. So I'm gonna switch that back to one before we leave here. So now I've got a parameterized SQL query to pull in the target for that filling machine. The last one I'm gonna to connect to is that HR system. So I'm gonna say HR rest. And for this one, I kind of cheated because I don't have uh, I wouldn't let me connect to our own HR system for, for good reason. Uh, so I, I ha kind of hacked my own just REST API. So in this case, I've got a little Express Node.js app that's running on 889 that I can query. And I'll, I'll show you that real quick in terms of what it returns. So I'm just going to create an input for that REST interface. I'm going to call it uh, operator. 
So basically I wanna get the operator that's currently on the machine as part of my data. And in this case, it's just a, a basic REST request. So if I come down, oops. Oh, it's in there, sorry. Uh, Zoom is hiding my save button. And if I hit read, this is gonna fail. And the reason this fails is because this is an old, terrible REST API, which believe it or not, we encounter these. And it, this is some code, but if you look in here, what I'm returning is some XML with escaped JSON inside it, right? And honest to God, I've seen this, it's happened uh, already. So this is one of those cases where we're gonna query something that, that's returns something that's a little weird. So I'm gonna use the XML parser to try to partially pull that in. And you can see I get the data element, but I get this kind of escape JSON. And I, I could go into the instance and try to massage this, but really, you know, the input's weird. I want to be able to deal with it. So we're going to use a new feature called custom conditions. And I'm going to call this HR data uh, parser. And in 2.4, we added a new custom condition in here. And what this is, is the ability to run some JavaScript on any input to do that kind of massaging of the data before you get to the modeling step. So what I'm doing here is I'm pulling in the raw input that has the escape JSON in there. And this is, it's covered in the user guide, but there's some syntax in the expression you can use to get the current value of this thing. So that syntax right now is, is this to get the current value. So I'll submit that. And in 2.4, we added the ability to read conditions. So I can select the source that I wanted to read. And when I hit read, this is gonna run it through the expression, which right now just returns the value verbatim. I did nothing to it. So you, you can see this is kind of useless. But what I can do is start to write some JavaScript. So I can do parse on the data field. And if I save that and run it, what we should see is it's gonna parse that and unescape that JavaScript. And now it's, use, it's much more usable inside of high bytes. So now in my instances, I can reference this instead of referencing the raw input. This is you know, really cool functionality. This could get more complex depending on what you have to parse and there could be repeatable code. So I'll quickly show another feature we added in 2.4 is kind of these global functions. So if you jump over to the admin panel in here, you can write functions in here, parse weird uh, JS. And you could write this function and then call this function inside. This is available anywhere as an expression or custom condition. You can call these custom functions inside of those. You can reuse code. Another really, I'm not gonna use it here because what I'm doing is really simple. But another cool thing we just added in 2.5, which we're working on now is the ability to import third-party NPM packages. And if you do that, you can use you know, third-party code to go do parsing or, or whatever you need. And you can reference those inside the custom conditions. That's in alpha already. So if you're interested in that, I'll let us know. We have some cu early customers using it to um, parse some custom binary payloads coming over MQTT or, or webhook. Okay, so we, we've got our three data sources, right? We went and built these out. So now we're gonna go model it. And I've already, I've cheated a little bit and already defined my model. So in here, you know, my model is just a filler ID, you know, the current rate that we're filling, the target rate for the shift, the current quality, uh, the target quality, and then the operator. So what I'm gonna do is go create an instance of this. And I'll just call it filler. And here, and it's based off the filler model. And here's the magic of high byte right now. All I need to do is go in and select the different data types and kind of map those all in. So I got my shift total coming from OPC, uh, from SQL. And remember all these inputs are set to default to the first, um, the first filling machine. So I've got my shift total target and the quality data, quality target. And then the last one I want is that operator. And if you remember, I can't use the, the raw condition, right? Because if I went a raw input, so if I went in and tried to expand this, I just get the data element with the weird JSON, but I can reference it through the condition and get the, the actual operator name, which I've called username. And because this is filler one, I'm just gonna manually set that default ID for now. And I will fight with zoom. There we go, hit submit. All right. so. If I hit read now, what you'll see come back is that model data from OPC, from SQL, and then uh, the operator coming from um, the HR system. So that's all good to go. So now I'm gonna push that up into my UNS, right? So I'm gonna create a connection called UNS, and really that's just MQTT. And I've got a local mosquito broker installed that I'm just gonna push to. And I'll keep all the settings uh, as the defaults, hit submit. And I want an output, so I'm outputting to the UNS. So I'll go create that and I'll call this 
fillers out. In the topic structure, I'll sort of start to ISA 95 this, but you could imagine I could build this out. I'll just call it filler. And then I am going to use dynamic outputs to put the filler ID in the, in the topic, just so we split it up. And now that I've got all of that done, I'm just going to do this last arrow. The arrows are really the flows of data. So I'm just going to go in and create a flow. I'll call it 2UNS. And I'll grab the instance we created. And I will output to my UNS output. And if I did everything right, cross your fingers, we'll pull up an MQTT client. And you can see that data model is being published out. OK, cool. So we got it to work for filler one. So how do we get it to work for filler two and three and six and seven and all those? So this is where we use templating. And to do this, what I'm going to do is, uh, just for now, so I don't flood the broker, I'm just going to turn this off. I'm going to go back into the modeling layer, and I'm going to turn on templating for the instance. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say I want to template this, and I'm going to control that filler ID up here. And, I'm, and rather than just put a default value, I'm going to put a range. Now, this syntax is the same as going one, two, three. You know, I can go one to two, uh, skip three, four. But what this means is it's going to expand those parameters into one, two, three. And I could have multiple parameters, et cetera. And I want the actual name to, to contain the parameter. So I'm going to do, I just want to control it. So filler ID, and that'll be the name of the instance that gets generated. So let me save that. And the last piece I need to use is I need to use that parameter down here in the reference to, to, to build out each one. So instead of hard coding the one here, I'm going to do filler ID. And this is where the real magic happens. So what I can do is pass parameter, because remember I parameterize these inputs, so I can pass that parameter to them. And the way I'm going to do that is this syntax here. So I'm passing a parameter that is the filler ID, and I'm setting that parameter based off the template range that's up here. And I'm just going to copy and paste the syntax to each one of the inputs, because they all take the same thing, with the exception of the condition one down here. I didn't parameterize that. So if I hit Save and I hit Read, what it's going to do is it's going to fill out the filler one because that's the default. So the read is just going to test the first one. But if I jump to this new templates view over here, what you'll see is they have the ability to go and inspect that templating. So you can see filler one, two, and three. I control the name. And if I select two, it'll show you the replacement parameter for the filler ID is two. You can see how it's working here. Each, each expression passes you know, filler ID two to the input. And when I hit read, I get the result for two. Now, if I want, I can go and, and physically create these instances as configuration in high bytes. So I can turn them kind of from a virtual templated thing to a physical thing. I might want to do that if like filler three is weird, I would create that template, do the modification, pull it into the flow, and then everything else follows the, the normal template. But without any other changes, if I jump over here, now this is a, a templatized uh, instance. And you can tell that in the, over in the reference panel, you can see this little stack here it shows that it's templated. And all I have to do is turn this on. And if I jump to my connection, now you'll see filler one, two, and three are published. Right now, if I had a filler four that showed up, all I would need to do in high byte is go into my modeling instance. Now that this is all set up and just change this range to four, hit save. Now filler four is in there too, right? So this is how you could scale up to hundreds, thousands. You just map the first one, pass down the parameters as needed, and then you're done with very little uh, configuration. So pretty cool. OK, so with that, I've completed kind of the left side of this. So now I'm going to start working on the right side. I'm going to pull the data out of the UNS. Could be any data. In this case, it's the data that I just generated. And I'm going to put that in Parquet files. So to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is go back to my UNS connection and create an input. And I'm going to listen in on the same topic that I'm outputting. So I'll call this uh, fillers in. And I can't use the dynamic, so I'm just going to use the uh, the wildcard in MQTT to say, oops, pull in, you know, pull in anything that's here. So if I read this, what you're going to see is only filler th three is getting returned because the way the MQTT connection works is it's getting filler one, two, three right away, and it's caching the most the most recent one it received, which is always three, right? So it's going to be hard to get uh, to see in the test view the other ones. But I'll show you how you can set up the flow so you capture all of them. Uh, so I've got that. Now what I want to do is I want to set up my uh, parquet. So I want to take that UNS data and put it in our parquet, our parquet files, which is a new feature in 2.4. So I've already kind of I've cheated a little bit and already set this up uh, just for brevity. 
So I've got my Parquet output, and I'm just going to land these in a, in a file drive uh, on my systems. They're going to land here. There's nothing in there yet. And this is my connection. And then my output, I'm going to keep it really simple and just uh, put fillers at the, as the base name on the file. Now, if you look in here, you have the ability to kind of change the file names to make sure they're unique. So you can put timestamps or goods, et cetera. The other thing you can control in here is the duration of the files. So I just want one minute files because we don't have a lot of time. So we want to see these files build up. You could extend that. So there's one minute's worth of data in the file each. Okay, so with that set up, what I'm going to do is go create a flow to go um, UNS to Parquet, if I can spell Parquet right, which I did. And then input, I'm going to grab the UNS input. So I'm listening to all the filter data coming in. And then my output, I'm going to set it to my Parquet files out. Now, this is a new cool feature in 2.4. So if I just set this up as is and we poll, just like we did the test read, we'd only see filler three come through, right? Because the, the filler one, two, and three data is landing in MQTT like within probably milliseconds of each other. You know, the old model of high byte, we would poll and we'd only get the most recent one. So in 2.4, you can set an event-based flow. And what this means is I'm going to go back to the UNS input and pull that over. And what it's saying is anytime I get a message coming in over this topic over MQTT, execute this flow. If I get a thousand messages in a nanosecond, which might be impossible via physics, but you get it. If I get a bunch of data that shows up really fast, I'm going to queue that up and make sure that each one gets processed. So I'm guaranteed I'm not going to lose data on these subscription-based connections. This works for uh, MQTT, UA, uh, Webhook, and any Azure event hubs, anything that's asynchronous, the data that gets sent to Hybyte. So I'm going to turn that on to make sure we process all three, in this case, fillers. And uh, we just need to turn that on. And what we'll see is in the Parquet output, we'll see a temp file get created. So that's building up the data for the one minute. And once the one minute's up, we'll see data land. So while that's going, let's go look at the last leg of the journey, which is pushing these files up into Azure and AWS. So I've cheated a little bit too. I've already created those connections. So let's look at AWS first. It's the first in the list. So I've created an AI or IAM role uh, that has access to my S3 container. And I won't walk through that, but you need the keys uh, to be able to grant permission in my region. And then in the output settings, if you go look at S3. I've created a bucket uh, called Aaron test, right? So that's where I'm going to push the data to. I did have to make sure this is open to the public. So there is, you can Google it, but you do need to change some settings to make sure you can push in and have permissions to do so. Uh, and then here, all I'm doing, so I'm specifying the bucket name. I could do a lot to control the name of the key, like how those files are partitioned, et cetera. I'm just going to use the defaults in Hybyte, which is going to insert a timestamp and a GUID to make sure files are unique. You can also take files over uh, MQTT or that are base 64 in the base 64 encoded in the payload, but I'm just transferring files direct. So I'm going to leave all this standard. And that stuff is, uh, that's all in the user guide. Very similar over in Azure Blob Storage. I have an endpoint URL and a connection string. Uh, just for completeness in the demo, what I'll, I'll show you where those come from. Uh, so down here, if you go to endpoints in your uh, blob storage container, that blob service endpoint, that's the one you want for your endpoint. And then in terms of act, you go to access keys, show keys, and grab the connection string. And that's the credentials to connect in to blob. Very similar to the output, I have a container called uh, Aaron Test. If you saw it, um, let's go to containers. So that's in there. Uh, and I can, again, I control the blob name and stuff. I'm just going to leave that all as default. The last piece I need is just to pull the files in. So I'm going to use the file connector. This was, I think, added in 2.3. So I'm just going to look at, and I'm going to treat the files natively, right, atomically. I'm just going to move them. I'm not going to open them up. I don't care what they are. In this case, they're Parquet. But I set the input to look at the Parquet uh, file input where I'm dumping the files. And then I have a process directory, which means when I'm done moving the file, I'm just going to move it to process just in case as a backup if I need it. Uh, and then on the input side, you'll see I'm just looking for any file in that directory. So if I turn on metadata and do a test read, you'll see those files are in there now, two of them so far, uh, and we'll send those up. So I'm going to turn off the metadata. I'm going to create my final flow, which is to cloud. And I'm going to pull in the uh, Parquet input. And I'm going to send it out to both. So I'm going to send it out to AWS S3 
and I'm going to send it out to Azure Blob. And I'm gonna, this is going to happen pretty quick. Now, I probably wouldn't make this go that fast, right? I'd probably slow it down because this the, the need to upload to the cloud, maybe it's once a day, maybe it's once an hour, but I'm just going to do it every second. So you can see these files go away really quick. So they got moved pretty fast. And then if I go up and, oops, I got to click on the container. So if I go up and refresh the container and I'll do the same up here. So now we're running a little short on time. You'll see the, the files got landed. Now I think I didn't put a filter in. So you'll see some files that were the temp files that I think I also sent up. I could create an input filter on the, the file connector to not send those up, but you see they landed in both spots. But these are the, the three files that were in there that have data. So let me just download one of them to complete the demo here. Or actually, let me just grab. So you see the interfaces are really similar, right? So let, what I have here is a, just a Parquet file viewer that I grabbed off GitHub. Thank you for whoever built that, uh, that runs in Windows. And I'm just gonna pull this over, dump the file and you'll see I can open that file up and you'll see the data for the filler machines that came out of the UNS, right? And it's the same data format that we published out of High Byte. So we have the name, the model, the time, the data that's in there. Susan Stanley is running every line today. She's crushing it, uh, but you get the idea, right? That same data model is now up in the cloud where it can be shared across the enterprise. You could compare performance across factories, you name it. I covered a lot of ground there. To complete this, but you can see within 20 minutes, you know, we went left to right and covered this whole thing. So hopefully that gives you some insight into the power of the platform and some of the cool features we added in 2.4 to enable this. So I will pause. I think we're ready for questions. That was awesome, Aaron. Great. I'm going to launch um, one last uh, poll question, Tori, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is asking, uh, as you think about Hybite in your deployments, um, what are you using for edge technology and that you would install Hybite on? Would you be using uh, the operating system? Are you using virtual machines, Docker images, Kubernetes, or the various cloud, cloud platforms? We love these polls because they allow us to get feedback from, from people that are interested in the solution to various questions that we have, right? As we're thinking about what do we need to test? What do we need to develop for? These polls are, are really helpful for us. So we certainly appreciate all of your feedback. We're probably about at the end there. So in that, I'll uh, share the results with everyone. So definitely a uh, lot of virtual machines. Um, some on the native OS and some on the Docker. Those are definitely the primaries with a little bit of uh, cloud edge technologies as well. So thank you very much for sharing. Great, okay. I'm gonna um, go a few questions. Some came in from Q&A, others from chat. The first one is um, related to templates, Aaron. Can I use a combination of OPC UA collections and instance templates? And then if so, knowing I need to model the data, should I templatize the input or the instance? Uh, yeah, no, great question. It depends, right? The, the beauty is you could kind of do either. When you saw me use the collections in UA and I rename stuff, you could say that's kind of pseudo modeling, right? I can at least rename the tag name. So in cases where you know, you're pulling data from OPC and you're going direct to Influx or direct to Pi or some system and you don't, you're not mixing data, and you don't, you know, you don't really care to mix data or changing data types or anything complex, you could probably just get away with using collections and moving that data. There's, there's quite a few use cases that are like that. But when you get into cases where you want to mix data across, you know, different systems, like I was showing, collections are just a way for you to reduce the cardinality of tags, right? You don't need 10,000 tags. You can group those tags logically, and it just makes the mapping and instances much easier. Great. Thank you. Uh, there's a there's another question that came in and it was answered in the Q&A, but I just thought I would bring it up here um, just for clarity's sake for all of the attendees. You know, today we showed a lot of connectivity with the cloud because of the connections that were added in 2.4, particularly for data lakes, warehouses, et cetera. Um, can you talk a little bit about like on-premises connections and our ability to connect to on-premise historians and ERPs? Um, 
doing that just just as seamlessly as the cloud for for users that um, I think in that poll that John showed um, for those um, that aren't moving data to the cloud. Yeah, I'll take a, a crack at that, Aaron. You can yeah. also add in after me. Um, we we definitely, you know, you don't have to be using the cloud. In fact, you can install our software on premise and only um, support systems on premise, and there's no direct connection to the cloud. Um, some of the new features that we've added obviously you need access to the cloud because we've been adding a lot of connectivity to the cloud. That seems to be a key technology set that people are adding and in, in projects that they're doing today. And so we've been asked um, to add those features and capabilities so that people can leverage the cloud with their industrial data. But we do have customers um, who are not using the cloud and that's perfectly fine. The solution works uh, great with just your on-prem systems to collect data, move data, process data, and deliver data to all your on-prem systems. In fact, we have one customer who is pulling from their OPC, mixing it with some MES data, pushing it into, into their, their ERP and, and, and back and forth as well. So they're using the ERP to drive some information to then push down into their OPC layer. So um, lots of opportunities there. Definitely don't need to use the cloud though though a lot of uh, people are experimenting with that. And that's why we're talking about a, a lot of it. Aaron, did you have anything? Yeah, I would just summarize. I think that's great, John. I, I, you know, cloud gets the sizzle. Everyone's excited about cloud. I would say a majority of our use places are still on-prem, right? Moving data between, so, and just yep. trying to reduce the cost of integrations at that layer. So, yeah. Yep. Um, I have another question here related to UNS, which is, um, obviously still a topic that a lot of people are learning about and trying to wrap their heads around and, you know, definitions vary. So related to protocol options for UNS, the question is, so can we have AWS Azure directly subscribe to topics with MQTT in the UNS? Sort of not really, right? There is a, there's typically a translation layer between a broker running on-prem UNS up to the cloud. Uh, you know, we're, we're often used for that. The AWS has IoT Core, uh, which is sort of an MQTT broker, not 100% compliance. That makes it a little easier to integrate between a local broker and that. Azure doesn't really have the same, um, their, their IoT hub stuff is not uh, MQTT, so you do need a translation layer there. But even on both sides, you need to translate. And a lot of times you don't want to send all the UNS data directly up to the cloud anyway. You want to be pretty selective. And, the, there, and then there's okay. cloud costs too, right? You don't want to send all the data to IoT Core and AWS, it's too expensive. So that's why you see a lot of connectors from us to, to push to different things to try to land that data where you want it in the format you need it most effectively. Great. Uh, I have one more question here. I know uh, we're 10 till the hour and want to let everyone go soon, but the last question I'm seeing is, um, if I'm looking to automate the generation of thousands of models, does Hibite limit me to using the click and drag UI or can I do any file imports or scripting tools? Uh, yeah, so, so you can. So all of our configuration is stored in a JSON file, you know, you, and there's an API to upload models. So we can share, that's a REST API. So you can use that to, to auto-generate models uh, pretty quickly or any, any configuration in high bytes, that option is there, uh, which is longer term, you'll probably see us have different import options through the UI. So if you have your model definitions, as an example, we're looking at one for DTDL, which is Azure's modeling language, you know, be able to take those models and import them into high byte or export high byte models into DTDL. So I think right now the REST API or editing the JSON is the way to do it. What you'll see in the future is more uh, features for us to be able to import export models and make that very easy for users in various formats. Great. John, you want to wrap us up with next steps? Uh, sure. Everyone can see my, see the PowerPoint, I believe. So we've got some contact information on there. We've got, uh, you know, if, if you want to talk with our team, reach out to us, sales at highbyte.com. Um, you can also join our trial program or, uh, you know, learn more about the solution. Um, you've got my email, uh, Aaron's email. Um, this recording will get posted to uh, YouTube. So if anyone wants to show it to others within their facilities, you'll certainly get an email with it. But 
Um, you can also send them to our YouTube channel where there's a lot of great uh, content. Um, we do a lot of videos, uh, shorter videos, to show specific uh, capabilities in the product. And of course, our website has a lot of content as well. So um, with that, I think uh, we're, we'll wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tori, for, uh, for coordinating the, the, the um, questions and resolving any issues. And it's great to, uh, to talk with you. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye.